Paleoart, oh Paleoart, what has happened to Paleoart? It hasn't gotten anywhere and probably never will. Humanity could go extinct, and the only way we'll be remembered is if sentient squid monsters try to reconstruct what we looked like just based on our bones. All fellow paleoartists know this, but reconstructing a prehistoric animal is not as easy as one may think. Not only do you have to take into account how skin, muscles, and integument looks on modern animals, but you also have to understand the skeletal anatomy of the very animal you're working with. Trying to understand these skeletons is a lot harder to do when you realize that the animal you're drawing is incredibly fragmentary, or has a poor fossil history. And this applies to nearly every prehistoric animal. Dinosaurs, extinct mammals, this grim reaper looking son of a- One dinosaur that has been a pain for paleoartists everywhere was the Central Asian Centausaurus spinorhinus. This was a Chinese hadrosaurid ornithopod from the late Cretaceous period, and it's most famous for... Uh... Well, you'll see. Sintausaurus was first discovered in 1950, and was found near the city of Tsingtao in the Shandong province. This is what led to the animal's genus name, which of course translates to Tsingtao lizard. Its species name, Spinorhinus, however, referred to the bizarre crest on top of its skull. Now, crests on hadrosaurids are nothing new, but this one was weirder than most. It was long, hollow, and had a bulbous extension at the very tip. Scientists apparently compared it to the horn of a unicorn, but nearly everyone else agrees that it looks very much like it. Alright, alright, are the YouTube mods gone now? Now, whether the whole crest was preserved or not was unknown for some time, but there was a lot of evidence here that said that it wasn't. The skull was missing several important elements, and even appeared broken in a few areas. Somehow, since hadrosaurid crests are incredibly diverse, hardly anyone questioned how the skull should look, and paleoartists kept up this part of its design. Some artists even added some speculative inflatable sacks, likely inspired by certain seals, while also making it look like something that will get my video taken down. Eventually, in the early 90s, someone finally looked into this bizarre crest to understand what it really looked like. They theorized that this crest was actually a nasal bone that appeared the way it did due to the fossilization process. They even suggested that Centausaurus was potentially an example of another Chinese hadrosaurid, Tanius. However, in 1993, another specimen would show the same exact crest, and essentially proved that the nasal bone theory was incorrect. Plus, Tanius was later found to be a dubious taxon, so there were a lot of problems here. But, after a bunch of discoveries, studies, and really uncomfortable paleoart, we may finally have a good idea as to what the crest of Centausaurus really looked like. Around the early 2000s, a paleontologist by the name of Jonathan Wagner took notice of the skull material that was missing from the original specimen. He also looked at its relatives in the hadrosaurid subfamily it belonged to, the Lambiosaurines. These are the hadrosaurids that everyone and their grandma are familiar with. This family includes such icons as Lambiosaurus and Parasaurolophus, and all members of this family have enormous, hollow crests that were used for visual and audio display. So with this information in mind, and with the help of fellow paleontologist Albert Perito Marquez, Wagner came to the conclusion that the spike of Centausaurus was really the back of a larger hollow crest. Starting from the midpoint of the snout to the back of the skull, this crest would have been more similar to those of its closest relatives. The air passages in their crests would have allowed Centausaurus to let out low-frequency calls, which would have been important in the forested habitats they called home. You see, in most jungles or forests, low-frequency sounds travel further through dense vegetation than ones at a higher frequency. Though, it may still be hard to hear their call since this region was home to numerous different dinosaurs that were all capable of making calls at a similar pitch. Unless Centausaurus sounded like an orangutan, you can seriously hear those things for miles. Whoa! 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 
Now, Centausaurus had a funny paleontological history, but there is a lesson to be learned from it. Paleontology is an ever-changing field of science, and new discoveries cause us to reevaluate everything we think we know about these extinct animals. As a result, most paleo art will inevitably become outdated, and at some point be viewed the same way we look at old art from the 1970s or earlier. But that's just par for the course when you're a paleo artist. Whenever we draw, sculpt, or animate an extinct animal, we always have that reminder in the back of our minds that our artwork will inevitably become outdated in some way. In fact, a lot of the unfavorable art of Centausaurus was considered scientifically accurate at one point. So I suppose the moral of this video is that if you create or want to create paleo art, don't be afraid that whatever you make will become outdated. Celebrate it, because that's how paleontology is. But that is the end of the line for this video. Don't forget to like and comment on this video as it lets YouTube know that people like this content and want to see more. Thank you guys so much for subscribing to this channel, and once again, you guys have not let up since the last one. Now that we're riding high at 791 subscribers, I'm starting to think that we may need to make that 1,000 subscriber milestone video sooner than I thought. Well, that's it for now. See you around.